I look at my clock, I'm like, that's so ugly. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to design yeah. one. It just feels like I'm running on an internal machine and there is no time to like stop and breathe. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Creative Confessions, where we talk about all things Artist Alley, manufacturing products as an artist, and small business advice. I'm your host, Macy, and I'm the artist and designer behind Molokana, a small business focused on kawaii designs. As your small business grows, you might find that working within the limited space of your home might be too much, and there's two common options you may consider looking into. One, renting out a studio space, or two, working with a fulfillment center. There is no wrong answer with either one as you figure out which will work best for you. And with this, I'm excited to welcome our next guest who has worked with a fulfillment center and warehouse environment, in addition to vending in Artist Alley on top of working another job. Without further ado, I'm excited to welcome Lillian, better known as Dulu Dulu Design. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Very excited. This is like my Thank first international so artist, actually. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, I'm so yeah. honored. Oh, my God. Thank you. So I'd love to start out if you could share a little bit about yourself and how you started Dulu Dulu Design. So hi, everyone. I'm Lillian, uh, also known as the artist behind the brand Dulu Dulu Design. I started my business back in 2019. I remember very vividly it was July of 2019. I was walking down Anime North, which is the biggest anime convention in Toronto. I passed by Artist Alley. I saw these artists who were selling enamel pins. And at the time, I think enamel pins were like just recently introduced to like the convention scene. I was like so amazed. They had like these gotchas and I played at least like 20 rounds with them. After that day, I was just like, oh my God, I really want to become an artist. If I'm such like a big shopper myself I know the audience I know what I'm interested in like I would just want to make them myself so that's when I started going into artist alley or like becoming an artist right away like literally I got home I messaged the artist I'm like hi I'm interested in starting these could you like maybe give me some advice etc and the next day like I started my account and a month later I started my first Kickstarter it was all very like hot-headed decisions I would say yeah when I first started I was still a first year university student, so I was an undergrad, I had my first internship, so that summer I was like a bit more free considering that period of time, so I had a lot more time to invest in like designing and creating, and then COVID hit, everyone just stuck home. So I had a lot more time to just invest in designing. And five years later, we're here. Woohoo! I'm actually Yay. curious, what's the meaning behind your shop name? Or how did that originate? To be honest, there is no special meaning. <laughs> I wanted it to be easily rememberable. So I was thinking like, oh, maybe we could do something that sounds like a sound, you know, like bang, boom, like something that's easy to remember. And ironically, I was listening to Blackpink's Doo Doo Doo. And I was like, oh, what about Doo Doo What's really funny is that Delulu became a really big meme. Mm. Every time I vend at like cons and markets, people are like, oh my god, Delulu design. Or they're like, oh my god, your business has such a catchy or like smart name. And then I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> but the thing I'm always scared about is people search about my name on social media and they can't find me because they search Delulu design, oh. but not Delulu Delu designs. I mean, it's not like a very similar experience for me, but I've I do understand that with having kind of like a made up name as a shop name, because if I didn't have somewhat of like a social media following, I don't know if people would remember Molkana because it's so made up compared yeah. to other people who might have drawings by so and so or something studio and it's like a regular something that isn't made up. But having a made up shop name, like unless you have a, a social media following, it's kind of hard to stand out because it's not something that comes to mind for a lot of people but I do like how yours yeah. also has that kind of alliteration with like the d do you currently do art full-time or is it a part-time situation yeah I do art part-time which might be surprising to a lot of people because they see me doing so much and they're like this is not your full-time job I'm like nope I just graduated last year I'm now on my first full-time job UX UI designer mm -hmm. at a tech company for those of you who might not know what UX UI is we also call it product design we design interfaces for online products or like softwares I would say my business actually inspired me to go down the UX UI design path mm -hmm. and I know a lot of artists who are actually also full-time UX UI designers I went to see like computer science and finance as undergrad 
and to my surprise, neither of those are things I'm interested in. <laughs> it does have like a more tech finance tune to when you know for Asian parents it's like, oh, these are where the money's at. And I kind of wanted to find a middle way where I can still work in tech, but enjoying what I want to do. I was already using the software they typically use mm -hmm. for my own business. And that's how I got onto UXUI really easily. And with your business, are you mostly, if not doing everything yourself, whether that's drawing, social media, vending at cons, and so on? So apart from the actual manufacturing part, I handle everything else pretty much by myself. So that includes working with manufacturers, social media, like planning, editing video content, customer service to like packing and like bookkeeping. I actually used to work with Fulfillment Center last year for some of my like larger products that includes like cardigans or like clocks where it was just too much to handle for myself. Well, mainly because like I live in an apartment, there is not enough space. I'm like, okay, we got to figure out some way <laughs> to ship these things. I've actually never shipped large product prior to that. I've only worked with pins so I was very scared I'm like oh I need to look for someone of expertise to handle all of this for me but then I ended my contract with them due to some hiccups and fiascos so now I handle all the shipping and storage of large products by myself as well that's perfect that you brought that up and I do want to ask a few more questions with how you balance mm -hmm. your business and on top of a full-time job and as you mentioned you used to work with a fulfillment center that would store your inventory and process your online orders. Um, and not too long ago, you went back to fulfilling orders yourself with your own workspace. I know you brought up um, some hiccups, but what really prompted that switch? Honestly, there were so many red flags. I was just scared to switch immediately. Some examples of the hiccups I encountered was first, they kept raising price. Mm -hmm. So it went from 250 flat storage fee mm -hmm. to $600 at one point. So last summer when I was on vacation, they messaged me, they're like, oh, we're raising storage fees. It's going to be $600 oh now. God. And at that point, I'm on vacation. Like, I can't do anything. I'm like, oh, I'm going to stop it and fly all the way back to Canada yeah. to like switch warehouse. And then the second month, they messaged me again, telling me they're doubling it to $1,300. 1300 I'm like, what the heck? And they're like, oh, yeah, we're expanding our business and accepting a lot of like the bigger clients now because you don't really qualify the minimum order quantity, mm -hmm. the flat fee we're going to charge you for storage. I guess at that point, I was like, okay, this is it. Like, I can't continue. There were a lot of other red flags. They are a local warehouse I looked for when I first found them. They advertised to me as being like no hidden fee, targeted for smaller businesses locally mm -hmm. who don't have a huge quantity of orders. So that's why I'm like, okay, I'm on, like, because of most of the other warehouses I've talked to, they don't think I'm a valuable customer because I don't have a lot of orders. I'm like, okay, I'm going to work with you guys. But as they grew, they increased the cost. But the actual quality of work is not increasing. Mm -hmm. I visit their warehouse from time to time, and it's just a huge mess. I see empty boxes stacked up, like, diagonally in the air. I see, like, <laughs> wrappings know. everywhere. And whenever I would try to find my own stock, I, I can't find it. They don't have an inventory tracking system, oh my God. which is really annoying. Yeah. Like, it's crazy. They don't really do quality checking. I had to beg mm. them for quality check. So for my clocks, which was a huge problem, like I had these tulip clocks designed, they were shipped, and then turns out more than half of them actually don't qualify as like the perfect grades. Like they're all slightly defected. So I had to go in person to do all the quality checking myself. I begged them to do quality check mm. prior to shipping each order. Like that would be much easier. But they're like, oh, we don't do that here. You should have hired some quality checking on Alibaba to do that. I'm like, I can pay you to do it. Just do I it. Know. Basically, the owner was like, oh, here are two workers who can help you with quality checking. And we spent like a day quality checking, like a quarter of the stock. A lot of my customers replied to me saying, Oh, they got the wrong order the quality of their product is not up to bar and i have to go back to the fulfillment center message them what's going on and then there's like a slower rate to respond and that frustrates me like i'm like standing in fire right now and you're just casually replying to me like two days later telling me hey what's up i'm like i can't handle this i'm taking over everything oh my by God. myself no yeah. i can't imagine how frustrating that is because you're trusting them to do everything that you're paying them to do. Like, it's not like something that you can just go to their warehouse like willy nilly because you have your own full time job. Like the whole point is that exactly. they're doing everything that you're paying them to do and they're not doing that. As someone who's considering fulfillment centers because 
I do want the freedom to travel and not have to worry about closing my shops, especially during like busy con season. But then I've heard so many like horror stories with like artists such as yourself. And I know, I think recently like Teal Teacup also recently left their fulfillment center. I don't know if it's like similar reasons as well. And now they have to process their own orders. And as someone who does do cons like relatively frequently, uh, it does feel easier to have it in my own workspace. But now that you have your own like warehouse workspace, do you fulfill orders like yourself or do you have someone helping you when you do those? Right now I pack orders myself and then um, I would ship my products via a driver. I have this driver I usually work with where I just be like, can you come pick up my orders, drop it off at the location today. I have a bi-weekly packing schedule, but packing takes forever, especially for large products. For my clocks, the whole process is I need to go to the warehouse to grab the clocks and then I bring them in. I build all the packaging materials like boxes etc i create the shipping labels print them and then i have to put like cut all these bubble wraps put them in the clock boxes and then cut more bubble wraps seal it put on the shipping label so much work i would say it takes about like seven hours in total for just like 20 to 30 orders and because i have a full-time job like i usually do it on the weekend and that's basically like one of my two day weekend gone right now i do it myself but i'm seriously thinking about outsourcing that maybe hire an assistant who can help me with it because like it's so energy draining I cannot no I can't imagine because I know your clocks did super well I think when I was looking Thank on your you. Instagram most of your like very viral videos like in the millions of views like were with the clocks so I can't imagine like how many you had to go through and I feel like with clocks they're not like like pins you can easily like pack a little bit and they're off on its way. The clocks, I feel like they could break easily. I mean, I haven't seen like the clocks in person, but I can't imagine like you have to make sure it's like packed really well. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of effort put into packaging. Like for example, the clocks, uh, when they manufactured it, they would use these zip ties to tie it to the box, but actually they only zip tie the stem. So the clock can still like sway around. So I have to put bubble wrap around it to make sure it doesn't sway. So I put the bubble wrap in, and then tilt the box up and down to make sure like it doesn't move. I hope it doesn't break during the transit. People message me back and be like, oh, there's like a chip on my clock. I'm like, oh, no. I know you did have a poor experience with your most recent fulfillment center, but I guess like what are some of the pros that you've experienced with working with one? I would say that there's still definitely a lot of pros of working with a fulfillment center like they handle almost everything that includes getting the packaging materials for example my clocks boxes bubble wrap shipping labels all that stuff they take care of it they even would go their own way to measure what size you should get for each clock they do all the shipping of course sometimes the shipping rates are cheaper because they work with some shipping services and because there's so much bulk orders, they get chip cheaper shipping rates, especially for like Europe and like Asia. And I would say it's really fast shipping handling. They can get orders out within one to two business days. Mm. And for Kickstarters, I remember like I had about 500 ish orders for my clocks and they were able to ship all of it within three days. Like that would <gasps> really? take me oh, a wow. month, yeah, three days. Because they have a lot of workers who are just dedicated to working on packaging. So, like, it gets out so fast. Like, three days. Yeah. <laughs> if I were to do it myself, it would take me at least a month. <laughs> yeah. And as you said, like, you can basically keep your shop open even if you're on vacation. Comes with complimentary storage. For me, who lives in an apartment, that's definitely a bonus. It takes off so much time from packaging. So you get a lot more time to be creative and work on things like designing. And I would say uh, one more really good pro if you're going to cons, they can arrange shipments of products directly mm. to the conventions or like to your own place. Let's say I like I need 50 cardigans. And if I have the products myself, I will have to go down to like wrap them by myself, but they can just like pack everything in one go and ship it to you. And how far in advance do you need to let them know that you need it for like a specific convention? My fulfillment warehouse was local. Sometimes I just go in by myself, like the day of, I'm like, hi, can I just come in today to grab some stuff? And they'll just be like, yeah, sure, anytime. Usually one or two days. Okay. Like oh, it's wow. really fast. Um, And I know you brought up some of the issues with your recent fulfillment center. I guess like overall, like what are some of 
the cons of working with a fulfillment center? With everything handled by everyone else, you also get less control on a lot of the things. For example, quality control. You would either have to go in by yourself or somehow work with the fulfillment center to figure out like a quality checking procedure. And that's definitely going to be additional costs. I guess also like trust issues. They're just there to pack their orders. They might not be as careful in the quality control procedures. Yeah, there's less flexibility in personalized orders. Like sometimes if you want to add a freebie, it's additional cost. If you want to include like a special birthday message or like customers have some requests in their orders, it's really hard to just personalize your orders or communicate that one specific requirement to the warehouse. I think the hugest con is the cost. Like it's really rare to find very affordable warehouses that takes up smaller quantities of orders. Like if you're a really big business, I think there's a lot of options out there. But if you're like smaller businesses like you and I, we can't have like 300 plus or like a thousands of orders every month consistently like just from online like that would be considered like a bigger scale business in general yeah but that's what they expect from you so most of the business i talked to they rejected me for having too little orders or they would show me these insane like flat fees thousands of dollars a month like i don't even earn that much from my <laughs> shop how would i be able to pay you off to do that right sometimes it's like the, the base fee doesn't look that high but it's the additional fees that like really hurts so most of the time what fulfillment centers do is they charge a base storage fee whether by per pallet or per shelf so if you have multiple boxes it might fit on a pallet and they could charge you like a couple hundred dollars a month and then for every single order you will pay a base fee per order like let's say two to three dollars but then every additional item you put in the order additional two dollars for every additional item you add like it's not that big of a cost if you have higher valued items for me it's like the cardigans or clocks but if it's like a pin where it's like ten dollars to begin with adding a two dollar per pin oh, it really yeah. hurts and you know what's crazy like if you want to just put in a business card or like a thank you card in there it's additional cost as well like they would like 50 cents a dollar oh. for additional card to put in there i'm like it's like the so cost of a business me... card isn't even a dollar <laughs> a lot of times there's also hidden fees they might not tell you sometimes but for things like inbounds outbounds or like additional labor fee they will like charge additionals on top of your bill and that can hurt a lot yeah especially when they have all of your inventory it's like can i really retaliate yeah. that much <laughs> I do want to share that Molkana is finally on Patreon. If you're not familiar with Patreon, it is a subscription service where you can support creators in exchange for additional exclusive content. In my case, if you want even more artist alley advice, sneak peeks of upcoming products, and more, you can get all of that on Patreon. So if you want more exclusive content or you just want to support this channel, feel free to check out my Patreon. It is down below in the description box. Now, like with that experience, would you ever go back to working with a fulfillment center? To be honest, at the moment, not really. But I also see a huge problem in handling everything myself. It's definitely not sustainable in the long run. It takes too much time, too much effort, no work-life balance for me, essentially, no time to create. A solution I am looking into right now is actually hiring assistants locally who can maybe go into the warehouse I rented and handle the shipping for me. I think that gives me more control and is essentially cheaper in the long run. Yeah, like my self-storage warehouse right now is probably like $400 a month oh, for wow. storage. How many square feet actually, Or not square feet? How is uh, it in Canada? <laughs> 20 by 15 square feet, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's huge because uh, like with all the clocks and like the merch I have, there's like just one tiny way in the yeah. middle where i can like squeeze in <laughs> i think it's worth the value because i go in like once every two weeks or month yeah that's pretty reasonable but with all of this now i'm curious and i know you just also congrats on graduating um very thank amazing you it's been a year but <laughs> thank you <laughs> do you ever see yourself doing art full-time instead of your current career with ux ui in the very near future probably not but in the long run, yes, I do. And I think that's the goal of every small business owner. We want to run our business full time and potentially be financially secure from it. <laughs> Definitely, I want to grow my business to a scale where I can rely on it full time, get enough financial security, get enough growth over time and make it sustainable. Right now, I definitely don't have enough time to focus on my business with my full time job. 
I have so many ideas in my queue, but then I have a ton of other logistics issues on my to-do list. But right now, I also see the skill I learned from my full time being very valuable for my business and for my personal growth in general. So that's why I don't want to jump straight into my business. Right now, my biggest problem is more so how to outsource and spend more time in doing the more valuable tasks like creating and growing my business rather than like logistics and repetitive labor that can be replaced easily. Apart from that though, there's also a lot of problems, personal insecurities about running only on business. Like right now, it's just a hobby. I'm like, my full-time job is my income. Money earned from my business is call the fun money <laughs> like that's yeah. where I can like you know squander the money on buying things I want without thinking much about it but once it becomes full-time I feel like there's going to be a lot more pressure and sometimes I feel like that pressure is going to hurt the creativity like I like I'm scared about that my business is kind of like my hobby on the side if I'm feeling tired I actually can work on it I can work on designing and I can feel really free and happy about it i don't know if it'll be the same if it becomes a full-time job finance wise like it's always scary to think about how much you will earn from your business especially it's when it's like self-employment it's inconsistent and you know it flows with the economy if the economy is down artist alleys don't perform as well yeah. which i can tell from this year and lastly like growing up in an asian family there's that pressure or like that stigma where art can only be a hobby but can't be full-time i'm constantly trying to fight myself thinking that's wrong like when i first started my business my grandparents who i grew up with were very against it they're like why are you spending your time in these arts like you know you should work on building your skills for finding a job blah 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 but once i showed them how much i earned they shut up <laughs> and they're like good job but yeah. then they're still like oh this is a good to have the money you earn from your business is a good add-on to your financial security but they don't see it as going in the long run and like relying on it completely i ask because I'm also not opposed to, I mean, I do this full time, but if I did a corporate job, like I'm not opposed to artists having a corporate or just full time job and then doing this on the side because yes, there is that job security. I mean, obviously it's not like 100% secure, but it's a little bit more secure versus doing this full time because it's based on the economy. Are people even willing to buy your work? And then do you even get into anime cons? I don't, we can talk about anime cons in a little bit but it's so competitive now that the cons that I got into last year I didn't get into this year and I did have some kind of like financial instability during that time because not that I expected to get in this year but it would have been nice to get in this year and even with having a corporate job there's insurance there's retirement funds like retirement opportunities besides like the usual Roth and whatnot unless you get to a point where you can actually pay your bills and have a little bit extra with your full like with your art it's very difficult to do this full time so i really don't like i don't blame anyone for wanting to do this part time and same thing with the creativity aspect you put in a lot of energy in your job do you have enough time to work on your small business and do you have the energy to be creative um, luckily for you you can expend like that creative energy with your small business but if you were to do this full time I feel like I'm at a point where can can be creative but sometimes there is that pressure of oh like do I need to make pins for this specific anime because it's popular or do I actually want to do that luckily I, I haven't been in that situation like I love all the anime that I've uh, drawn and since we did talk about conventions and you also vend at cons when did you start vending? My first con was two months after I started my business. Mm. It was September of 2019. It was a con in Toronto. I believe it was like the second time they ever held it. It was a very dead con. <laughs> <laughs> I probably made around $400 throughout the entire weekend. Mm. You know, as a starter, I was like, wow, that's a lot of money. But now it's like, oh, <laughs> that that's a loss. <laughs> so there all the money you poured into just attending the con like the, the, the convention fee the transit and if i were to do it today like i take uber rides to conventions because i have so much stuff mm -hmm. and i don't have a car when i first attended the con it was eye-opening experience for me like whoa this is what it's like being on the other side of the table <laughs> and what type of events do you usually vend out so i attend mostly local anime cons for toronto there's three really big conventions here comic con fan expo and then there's anime north 
which is more like anime targeted. Occasionally, I would attend local markets. I think I really started exploring opportunities in local markets like since 2022. But I'm like becoming more selective about what type of local events to attend. I usually attend the ones that focus on like AAPI or more pop culture. Or like more hippie, trendy markets with a lot of young adults. So I would attend markets in universities hosted by clubs because you know a lot of students, a lot of young people, and occasionally like maybe Japanese themed markets. There's also、um, markets here held by local artists、um, in Toronto. There's this one called Tomo Arts Market, which is hosted by the artist Moogle Bunny, and it's basically like. A one-day mini anime convention at this point with a lot of artists locally. On top of that, since last year, I also attended a few markets hosted by some of the merch stores within our area. So, like when I say merch, it's like K-pop merch,、um, blind boxes, anime merch, Asian beauty makeup. Because like a lot of those customers overlap with like the convention audience. And since. When you started in 2019, how many events have you done since you first began? 2019, I attended two conventions and one market in my university. 2022, the reason we jumped to 2022 is obviously we know what happened.、Yeah. I attended four large cons, five local markets. That's the year I started exploring a lot of local markets, and then last year I only attended two conventions just because, like most cons, happen in the summer. And then I was on vacation most of the time. But I did nine markets in total. To be honest, I would say more than half of those didn't really do well. But I was just trying to test the waters, see what works well. And this year, so far, I've attended two local cons, and I'm also planning on expanding to out of province. I have a few coming up that's in Montreal and in Vancouver. Everything added together, so far, I've attended ten conventions and seventeen markets. So, as someone who is based in the United States and more specifically Los Angeles, we have quite a lot of cons and smaller anime-specific events in the area. And as you're based in Toronto, Canada, I have heard of several big Canadian cons, as you mentioned, Anime North. Would you say that there is a pretty good number of cons or events for artists who? Are wanting to get into Artist Alley in your area? I would say for Toronto, there's a decent amount of conventions, especially for artists who are starting, and a lot of markets actually. Apart from the ones I said, there's Hin and Pat Show. We also have a couple of markets held by the art schools here.、Mm. There's one called like Mutual Art Fest, OCAD, and we have like a lot of hippie markets. So I would say if you want to just start, there's a lot of opportunities. But the competition overall across Canada is just really rough. If you're like out of province in Vancouver or Montreal, like there's a few less cons in general and markets. So a lot of those people also try to come to Toronto, and like us, a lot of the Toronto people also try to go to those provinces. And there's so many new rising artists since COVID, including myself. I know for Anime North, which is the biggest anime convention of Canada, so they've adapted a lottery approach to their Artist Alley. Fortunately, I was not in Artist Alley. They have another term called Pro Plaza, which is、mm. for artists who are selling purely original art. Like that's first come first serve, and even that competition is really rough. I was talking to other artists who signed up; they were rejected, even though they handed it in like three minutes after it opened. It was really rough. And then for the people who are entering the lottery, apparently the entire Anime North website broke down because of how many people were swarming in to apply. Not just the sign up sheet. Like we have a Discord chat for all the Canadian artists, and they're all just like so confused about what's happening because all of them are like, "Oh my god, did I apply? Did I apply? Did you apply?" But nobody could figure out what's happening. Like, and then we're talking to the organizers, and they're like, "Oh, there's so many people swarming in. Like, we thought there was like a DDoS attack." I'm like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> like that happened. It was like really, really rough. So yeah, every year the competition is just so wild. For things like Comic Con or Fan Expo, they have like rollover. So if you did last year, you can just rebook. That's relatively easy for people who attended. But then for new artists, it also means there's like less chance. Like you have to sign up the moment it opens, basically. Yeah, but for things like Anime North, where it's like pure lottery system, it's just purely by luck. For a lot of artists, it's like the biggest con where like they earn the most within the country. And not doing it is a huge loss. But now I'm curious, how do you manage vending at conventions while you have your full time job? That's a great question, and the answer is simply, no, I don't. <laughs> so at the beginning of this year, I set my goal to grow on social media. Okay, I'm gonna do reels. I'm gonna like. 
post two to three times a week. And that alone basically resulted in not a single weekend for three months to be used for my own personal life. Like it was all planning, filming, editing, planning, filming, editing. My whole life was just full-time job, my business. And even on the way to my work or from my work, I would be editing videos or like planning for my business in transit. I was sacrificing my weekends. I was always doing last minute preps for conventions, like even for conventions, like I'm like always like half sleepy because there were so many things I had to do on my to-do list. For the conventions, I have to beg my friends to come help me. <laughs> like for the conventions, especially for the big ones, you cannot do it by yourself. Oh, like no. it's very chaotic. For markets maybe, for, for big conventions, I cannot. In school, like my friends are more free because like when I was free, they were also free. But once everybody started working, like, I literally have to beg them to come help me because it's their personal time as well. Actually, my best friend, who is also my roommate, invited her whole gang of friends from Ottawa to come help me at a convention last Aww. year. Like we had like five people staying in my place and just like rotating and helping me at the con. It was so fun. In essence, I don't balance between <laughs> working for my full time and selling at cons. I started to realize it was a big problem. If you have noticed, I haven't really posted any videos since like April because I was really like burnt out. I'm like, this is not good for my health. It's not good for my work-life balance. Everything feels like it's a burden rather than something that's like enjoyable. Like I see the numbers going up but at the same time. I'm very fearful of it going down the moment I stop or like I'm always thinking about, okay, what's next? What's next? It just feels like I'm running on an internal machine and there is no time to like stop and breathe so i was like okay you know what we're just gonna focus on my personal well-being so i started going out with friends like, actually doing activities that's not business related again that's a good state to be in i feel like i'm in that situation too with friends because when i was doing cons like a few years ago some of them were still in college or they had like low lift part-time jobs so of course they're more likely to have that free time to help me out. But now that a lot of them either like graduated college or have their own jobs where they're working like almost every day, I have to beg them to like, please take your PTO, please ask this off. Like I cannot do these cons by myself because it's, it's too much, uh, especially when you have it's like bigger items, you can't. Since you're based in Canada again, and you primarily focus on Canadian cons, would you consider vending internationally, such as in the United States? Definitely. That's something I've always wanted to do. But I know on top of that, there is a lot of concerns as to how I can do it. So my biggest concern right now is how to ship my products all the way to the States because I have so many large products. I know other artists can maybe just bring like one or two suitcases, mm -hmm. but I probably have to ship like six, seven boxes ahead. So like who's gonna handle receiving the shipments? How am I gonna get them to the convention? Like that's all problems to me. And of course, like there's concern about travel costs. Probably have to fly, book hotels. Um, I haven't really done any out of province cons right now. All of them are locals. There is no hotel cost so far. There is no flights. Maximum is like Uber rides two Uber XL rides, Airbnb or a hotel like that's a couple hundreds a night. And if I have a helper, I also need to book their flights, book their accommodations. Like I've asked around other artists who do US cons and they tell me it's a problem uh, when it comes to like payment handling. Mm -hmm. If you're not like a dual citizen, you will need basically like either someone to handle the payment for you who is a US citizen or like you handle by cash or square payments. Did you know that Canadian Square and US Square, like they're the same device, but they don't work with each other? Like you oh. can't use US Square in Canada and you can't use Canadian Square in US. No, I like, didn't know that. That was so mind-blowing to me. Apparently not. To oh. use the US Square, you need a US bank account linked to it. And obviously, like, oh. as a Canadian, I don't have a US bank account. So that's, like, a problem over there as well. Mm -hmm. And then I think the biggest issue for everyone is just how to legally sell in the States. I know most artists I worked with, like, they tell me they're either, like, dual citizen or they have, like, family over mm -hmm. there or they just ship their products over and then just, you know, fly there as if they're attending conventions. I've also heard horror stories about people who's attempted to cross the border. They got caught by border security and they're like, so what are you doing? They're like, I'm selling at conventions. Well, do you have a legal visa or like permit to sell? And that's when they're like, uh, and then their Nexus card got cut on the spot 
their all their merch got confiscated and they got basically told to go back immediately so like i definitely want to figure out ways to legally sell in the states and never get banned from entering the country i heard there's a lot of obstacles you have to apply for proper visa it's pretty hard in general i definitely want to sell in the states i think if i can find um someone who can handle the visa or like properly guide me or i know sometimes there's also proxies who can um, figure out all the handling like that would be very ideal. Yeah, there are so many conventions in the States. I see a lot of my friends going to Anime Expo. I'm like, oh, such FOMO, you know? <laughs> Everyone's gonna be there. No, I feel that. I actually want, probably in a future pod episode, I don't know when, but I would love to interview, I feel like most of them tend to be from Canada, but like a Canadian artist who does vend in the US and like to kind of talk about like that process because I have heard of some of those issues. I didn't know about the square reader thing. That's terrifying. But yeah, I hear like a lot of Canadian artists like the US cons, like as long as like it's the major ones like Fanime, Anime Expo, Anime New York, um, just because like the conversion rate is like really good. Yeah. So hopefully you get to do a US con soon, maybe in like the following year or so. <laughs> Hopefully I'll see you at Anime Expo next, yes! next year. That is the goal. Now we are moving on to our speed round um, slash miscellaneous round. What's a common myth surrounding product manufacturing? Actually, I don't know if it's an assumption, but um, it's an assumption I had when I went in. It's simple, like you just send in the design and you let go, like there's not much to do until you realize there's so many things you have to consider, especially for 3D products, for stickers or like enamel pins. I would say the procedure is more standardized and like straightforward. It's essentially printed product, very simple. You send in the design, you send in the color, you tell them like the make, and then there's a lot of resources out there to how to do it. But for other items like bags, apparels, or like clocks, there is so much going on behind the sampling process. It's more like this material doesn't work out the way you want. That material doesn't come in the color that we want. We have to buy additional fabric. This quality is not a par. Like there's a lot of pivoting where you just have to be like, okay, this doesn't work. How do we work around it? And the sample could take forever. For pins and stickers, probably like one week, two weeks for pins a month you can get them done for sampling for like plushies bags or even clocks it can go up to a year and you might still not satisfy with the result and it's not that every single manufacturer you work with you will be satisfied sometimes like you might be working on a sample for a whole year and it just doesn't turn out the way you want like it might just be a discarded piece of work there's always that sunk cost and i hope people know like there's a lot of effort being put behind it and good things take time. Yeah, you have to put in a lot of effort to get that good result. This applies mostly with like apparel or bags. And I feel like with some aspects too, but you can also ask if your manufacturer can ship you like swatches. I did ask, oh, like, can she send me like the swatches? So I have swatch like fall leather swatches of like the Ida bags. And then she also sent me like swatches of like the different because they also do plushies <laughs> so like the different plushy like fabrics so i can see like oh like i want this color and it's nice seeing it in person because photos are not always reliable that's also why sometimes i ask like oh can you take a photo of the bag or like the sample in outdoor light because it's a little bit more accurate but then you also have to consider like oh what is the color temperature on your desktop? Like maybe you have to adjust that. And having the fabric sample, you're able to see it in person under your own daylight. And I feel like that's a lot easier to manufacturers too, because they are not frustrated with you changing your mind because it's like not the right brown. <laughs> Obviously this is from yeah. personal experience. <laughs> There's just so much hassle working with manufacturers because I grew up in China. I speak Chinese. I can type in Chinese. Mm. And do you think language is not a barrier because we speak the same language? But no, it's a huge barrier. <laughs> We're speaking the same language, but they don't get what you mean. And a lot of times that causes additional hiccups, like the design does not turn out the way you want. And they're like, that's what you said. I'm like, no, that's not what I said. And I have receipts and they're like, oh, but we thought that's what you said. It just goes in the loops. Another problem in general that I've noticed is quality control. Don't ever believe in manufacturers when they tell you we have in-house quality checking. <laughs> That's BS. I've learned it the hard way for both my cardigan and my tulip clock. That's why I could never, like, I have to check the items myself. There's no way. And sometimes, like, when I quality check and I'm like, who approved this? Like, who allowed this to happen? Like, this is not, like, this is ridiculous sometimes. <laughs> What's your favorite event you vended at and why? For me, it's 
Fan Expo. Mm -hmm. Just because it's the biggest convention in Toronto, it's a four-day con compared to all the other ones. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more artists because the Artist Alley is so big. There's two venues. And a lot of the big brands who are coming in, like Bandai, Uniqlo, like it's just a really good experience, even as an attendee. Invite a lot of my friends to come help me, and I get a lot of times in break to actually go explore, go talk to other artists, or like just go get some freebies or visit the actual like brands itself. So I think it's a good mix of vending and attending in general. And it's like the biggest convention where like all my friends, all my artist friends will attend. So it's like a huge gathering for all of us. Mm. I think. I think that's the best part. It's like meeting everyone that time of the year and seeing familiar faces. And I think it's a really good time to socialize in general. You're lucky that they're all in Toronto. I mean, I'm not super familiar with like Canada or like which city is like the most populated. But that's crazy that they're all in Toronto. <laughs> when it comes to business, what do you invest in and what are you cheap about? I invest in a lot of things. And I really am cheap about anything at the moment. <laughs> I just spend money. And then I pray that the money will come back. Like I, I'm not <laughs> very, <laughs> yeah, I'm not a very good planner. Like I'm just like maybe this will be helpful. Who knows? I'll buy it. It's not that much money, and then I just buy it. One investment I had, not so helpful so far personally, is the Cricut sticker cutter. Like I used it fairly amount of time at the beginning when I first started because everybody was saying how. Cost effective it is to print stickers by yourself. You get more flexibility. You can test out things, but I still can't figure out how to print the stickers with the same quality as if like I order them outside. Like they have like that really nice finish. I think you have to buy additional like like laminate on top or That's something. That's what I've heard. I just so much effort like ordering the materials, cutting everything yourself. And then my, my Cricut like broke down a couple of times. I'm pretty sure it's already broken at this point. Like the collaboration was definitely messed up. Yeah, and now I just use local print shops who produce really fantastic stickers at like a relatively affordable price. But I also feel you on... I think sometimes I like to spend a lot on product samples. <laughs> it's like, am I even going oh. to sell it? I don't know. But that's what a credit card is for and upcoming conventions <laughs> it's like obviously yeah. like spend reasonably if you have a credit card but also like okay i have these cons lined up i'm gonna get the money back so it's okay <laughs> <laughs> that's what i think oh my god literally like every time you're about to spend something and there's like an inner thought who's like is this worth it and you're gonna be like I'll make back this money in no time, like at conventions, like convention is next month, you know, this is just like a fraction of the money I will earn, let's spend it. And I think that's how like money build up, like at the end of the year when I do bookkeeping and look through things, I'm like, oh, there's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I definitely spent a lot of money on samples last year. Like I was probably at one point working with 10 different manufacturers, each on a different type of sampling. Oh, dang. And then at the end of the day, I probably like continue with one of them. So like I still have <laughs> conversation that ended in January 2023 where the manufacturer replied to me and be like, so what do you think of this I know, sample? I know. And that whenever they ask that question, I'm just like, mm, this will take some time for me to think through. So I'm going to reply when I have a detailed list of how to improve it. Or sometimes I'm just like, I don't know how to improve it. So I just leave them all red. And then now I'm like, okay, now I can't go back and be like, this is what I think. Yeah. Because it's so late. So that money's just gone. No mute. Because this is a sample. Like this hat, it's like my Manaki Neko. I have like so many oh. hat samples and like I finalized the hats, but there was never like a good time for me to like do pre-orders for them. Like, I think this was from like two years ago and I'm like, when am I going to introduce hats? I don't know. There's just like no <laughs> good time, but at some point maybe because like the rep for that manufacturer left and I really like that oh. rep. So I don't know. I might just go with like another sample with another manufacturer at that point. Oh. <laughs> This could be for Artist Alley or small business, um, but what's your controversial opinion on Artist Alley or small business? If you want to grow on social media or you want to grow your business, fan art is the way to go. And this might be like controversial to a lot of people like, oh, what about originality? But if you want to grow a fan base at the very beginning, sometimes fan art is a good start because it's very easy to attract followers like you can still have your very unique art style and there is no need to, you know, go specifically into the most popular anime, like the most popular pop culture references 
that you're not even interested in. Like, no, like you want to find somewhere like a fine line between things you are interested in and something that you think will have an audience. Because if you want to start from the beginning, like having a, an audience could be helpful in terms of online sales at conventions, maybe not like I know a lot of artists who are very successful with not maybe like thousands of followers, but they still do very well at cons. It's also actually a really good media for you to communicate and interact with their followers. So when I first started, um, I focused primarily on shoujo animes. Like at that time, there was not a lot of shoujo anime merch, and I'm a huge shoujo anime or manga fan. So I like literally just focused on making merch related to shoujo animes. So all my followers were very interested in shoujo animes, and like I would do like these polls, like these stories about the new mangas, like the animes I watched, and there were like so much engagement going on. Like I just feel like it was a really good starting point. To have that engagement and make your followers know who you are as a person, or like make them feel like you're more closely connected. Yeah, I agree with that actually. Especially if you want to vend at conventions or even just start your small business as an artist, for like eighty to ninety percent of people, it is not bad to start with fan art because that helps build the audience. Like people will adjust to your art style. Maybe they'll get to know you better because oh. This person likes these types of anime. We have these things in common, and then eventually, as you build that community, you can start to transition into original characters if you like. And that's something that I'm currently doing right now. I would say, like the first couple years, I mostly did fan art, and there were a couple original art、um, sprinkled in. But starting maybe like late last year, I started introducing like my cat. My bunny, my bear.、Um, sometimes I forget their names.、Uh, I like have it written down somewhere. I'm trying to introduce them so that my audience is more familiar with them. And you can also see that with the way my branding is, like on my table display, the cat, bunny, bear, they're like displayed everywhere. And even this year with Anime Expo, I do have like free fans for like purchase of forty or more. And it's the cat, bunny,、Aww. and bear. So, ba- like, I want people to get used to associating my brand with those three characters to the point where if they see that, it's like, oh yeah, it's Molkana. You know, that's like a whole long process. But I do want that bond to be very strong. And you know, you can start with original characters in the beginning. We're not saying that it's difficult, but it's easier if you start with fan art. Especially for artists who are still exploring what type of art styles, like what kind of designs directions they want to go into, fan art could be a good inspiration for you to find where that art style you're interested in, or you want to develop in, and eventually like grow into art style you like, and then that's when you can really start exploring. Original characters or things you're actually really passionate about. It's kind of like fan art is a base for developing skills, almost at the same time, on top of like something you enjoy and something you find connections to. But if you already have an original character that you really like and you have a very strong vision of what kind of designs you want to do, please go ahead and go with that design, like right ahead. Like we're not stopping you. <laughs> What's your biggest business insecurity? Okay, there's a lot. <laughs> To begin with, obviously there's like financial security. But I think another insecurity I'm seeing in the near future is if I will still be doing this, or like if the art style I'm accustomed to right now will be something I will still be doing in like ten years. I started doing very kawaii stuff when I was, you know, in university, and I've already observed a change in my personal style, like even the way I dress. I'm not as Attracted to that same kawaii style when I first started. So, like, I still like very kawaii stuff, but right now, like, when I'm designing, I can see that I'm designing more like subtle cute or subtle kawaii rather than very, very like vibrant, super, super outgoing like styles. And I think that just comes with like growing up, or like your personal styles change all the time. And because my brand is built around that like very kawaii mindset, like I really respect. And enjoy seeing like people in their thirties or forties dressing up really kawaii style because I'm like looking at my own fashion style. I'm like, it's changed so much within like five years. Am I going to have the same fashion style in five years? Will that affect how I design my products? And does that also mean my audience will no longer be interested because it's such a drastic change? I think there's like a transition that I'm slowly observing in my own design. I'm trying to design for things that I know for a fact. 
that I will like, but my audience will also like, but not just something that I'm designing for other people. I think that's really important to me. Like when I'm designing something, I know for a fact I want to wear it. If it makes you feel better, you have to evolve in order for your business to do well. The only, I guess, like example I can think of is like Taylor Swift. But one of the main reasons why Taylor Swift has been so popular for over a decade now is because she keeps changing. And I feel like with your business, you do have to change. And, you know, you're not going to want to design things that you're not going to wear yourself. And I don't think your customers are going to want to buy from you if it's not something that you actually enjoy. I try to think in like that kind of abundance mindset that there will always be an audience for whatever you design. It might be harder to find like certain audiences, but there's always an audience and there will be people who buy your design. As long as you find that particular audience, like you'll be fine. When did you first feel successful with your business and what does that word mean to you? The first time I felt really successful was when I launched my frog cardigan Kickstarter. Well, I've launched a couple of Kickstarters before, mostly on pins, and they never got over five like digits. My frog cardigan was the first time where it surpassed that goal like way beyond than I expected. Like I remember sitting in the room with my friend when we first launched and then we projected the Kickstarter live stream <laughs> like on the TV. And every time it goes up, we're just like, oh my God, oh my God, it's going up, it's going up. And I think we hit like 20 or 30K in the on the first day. Dang. And I was mind blown. Like I never expected to be that great. It was also the first apparel design I had ever made. So it meant like a huge deal to me. And like, this is the step where I'm like, bro, I'm going out of my comfort zone. I'm like expanding into fashion, which I've always wanted to do. I love that. Congrats. That, that's you. amazing. <laughs> um, what business goals are you pursuing right now? So right now, I've expanded into fashion. I want to continue into exploring more fashion options. But I think I also have this goal to explore in home decor. I'm very random sometimes. Like how I design things is I go shopping and then I think about what I want like in terms of like what items I want like for the clock is literally like I look at my clock I'm like that's so ugly <laughs> and then I'm like okay I'm gonna design yeah. one that's, that's how I feel when I go shopping I'm like hmm, that's a good thing that's a good idea or, or like that's an ugly furniture maybe I'll design a cuter one so it's very spontaneous ideas that just jumps out of nowhere it's all things I want like I have such a huge like shopping mindset sometimes I'm like I'm just gonna design things I'm gonna buy and I think one of the biggest things I want right now is furniture because I really want to revamp my home. <laughs> so, like I had these like wild ideas like what if I just design a couch, you know, so I can use it in my own home. And then like there's that like other side of me who's like that that's so much hassle. Like you know how big of a couch it is. How are you going to ship that all that? But I'm like I just want to design it, you know. So, I don't know if it's ever going to be achieved, but I'm just going to put it down and hope for the best. I already started with like home decor. I feel like crossed. since you already have you already got an audience who can expect like home decor and furniture from you because like clearly your clocks did super well. Thank I feel you. like it's not that big of a pivot if you go in that direction because it's like, oh, she's probably going to have more home decor items. Like it's expected that there can be more home decor items to my business, but it's more like on my side, just thinking about how much hassle it was working with manufacturers on that single home decor item. Like sometimes I'm really scared about expanding, but sometimes I'm also very excited because I have all these ideas. And I think it's very unique in general because we don't see a lot of home decor items. Like it's a double-edged sword essentially. But also being an artist and having experience with manufacturing it is so rewarding having like so many options to design whatever you want and actually like having it come to life and then actually being able to use it just so fascinating like how big of a mindset change you will have once you become an artist i tell my friends like when i go on vacations i go on shopping it's not just shopping it's market research exactly it's seeing what's doable and realizing, wow, there's so many options out there. A hundred percent, really. Are you working on any big projects or new products or are you going to any upcoming events? I feel like you kind of mentioned it, but some that you'd like to share. Right now, I'm working on my first plushies featuring the fruit characters. I'm still working with the manufacturers on sampling, but I think they're almost there. Apart from that, 
I do have a lot of apparel designs in queue that I want to like sample really soon. I think a lot of them are already on my Instagram, like the fruit cardigan series, the duck bag, um, the tulip bags, all that stuff. Like it's all things I have a very big passion and urge to make as soon as possible. And it's just <laughs> working with manufacturers and sampling. Like I just need to take that step and we'll get there. Very fair. It is such an honor to have you, Lillian, on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Where can our audience find you? Of course. I'm on Instagram. You can find my handle at Dooladoola Design. I'm also on X, also known as Twitter, TikTok. And I am thinking of starting my YouTube channel soon. I'm going to be posting about some like convention vlogs or like travel vlogs. So look forward to that as well. It's the same handle name at Doodle Doodle Design. Yes. Um, hopefully we can meet in person at some point. <laughs> Maybe next year. Pray. The con gods. <laughs> <I'm praying. laughs> yeah. Well, thank you again for joining us and thank you to everyone listening in. I will see you all in the next episode. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for having me. (laughs)